This episode of Beyond the Uniform is sponsored by Storybox. People trust each other more than they trust advertising. Storybox provides companies with the tools they need to take the best things their customers are saying and use these testimonials to drive more sales and referrals. You can find out if Storybox is right for you at storyboxlight.com. If you employ a veteran, we'll also give you a 10% discount. That's storyboxlight.com. Welcome back to Beyond the Uniform. I'm Justin Nasiri, and each week I interview military veterans about their civilian career. My intention is to help those on active duty and transitioning veterans uh, figure out how to navigate their civilian career and find exactly what they want to do and how to succeed at it. Today is episode number 116 with Patrick McKenna. So I was a, a Signal Corps officer trained in telecom, right, and you know, managed switches and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and so really understood traditional telecom infrastructure. And uh, these engineers who became my co-founders, they had um, developed a, this soft switch. Basically, using your computer, you could control a big piece of hardware somewhere else and make the phone ring. And what I knew was that was massively disruptive. And what we didn't know together was where that disruption was going to lead us. And that actually led to eventually, you know, live ops. Well, I wanted to start off today's interview, first of all, by giving a shout out to two people. Uh, the first is to Lisa Sweeney, who introduced me to Patrick McKenna. Lisa, thank you for making that intro. I really enjoyed this interview. I benefited a lot, and I know listeners will benefit as well. I also wanted to give a shout out to Brendan Aronson over in Carlsbad, California. Brendan, you left a uh, positive review on iTunes a couple weeks ago. Greatly appreciate it. Uh, for those of you listeners who haven't had a chance to leave a positive review on iTunes, I'd greatly appreciate it. It definitely helps get the word out. So um, I think everyone listening is going to enjoy today's interview. Um, Patrick has a background in finance. He started at J.P. Morgan and Morgan Stanley. Uh, He has a background in startups. He's been part of the founding team of LiveOps, a company that has over $100 in revenue now. He's been uh, part of multiple successful startups. And then he started his own investment and advising firm where he invests in startups. So lots of different industries, but why I think this is relevant to everyone is, um, first of all, he's got some great thoughts on networking as well as how to prepare for meetings, something we've never really talked about on the show before. Um, He talks about how the best thing that you can do is invest in your network, and his story illustrates that. He's, you know, heads down, working, and opportunities seem to find him, um, largely due to his network and the people that he's met along the way. Second, he talks about building expertise. Uh, The interview with Steve Reineman, if you haven't listened to it, it's a great interview as well. The CEO of Pepsi talked about developing a hip pocket skill. Patrick talked about that in a different way, about building expertise. Uh, You know, he's someone who's rotated between industries as well as companies, but he's consistently built up expertise that he's been able to leverage throughout his career. And he talks about taking this 10-year lens on your career. I found the discussion very energizing, and it's a perspective I haven't heard a lot on this show. I think um, every veteran would benefit from that advice. And then lastly, resources. You know, Patrick has an incredible career path. He's very humble about it, but if you look at his LinkedIn bio, he's been um, part of some incredible startups and has done some great things in his career. He has great advice and great resources. This is one of the, the few interviews that I'm going to listen to. Again, it's, it's just filled with lots of really well-stated advice. And so, um, yeah, I think it's great. Um, Check out the show notes. There's a lot of links there to books, to resources, podcasts, um, many of those that I plan on reading as well. Um, So with that, let's dive in to my interview with Patrick McKenna. Joining me today in San Francisco, California is Patrick McKenna. Patrick, welcome to Beyond the Uniform. Glad to be with you. So for listeners, wanted to give a quick background on Patrick. He is the founder and managing partner at High Ridge Global, which is a private investment and advisory firm. He started out as an ROTC student at the University of Southern California, after which he served as a Signal Corps officer in the Army for four years. After his service, he got out and got his MBA at Georgetown. Uh, He's worked at J.P. Morgan, Morgan Stanley, uh, and was part of the founding team of LiveOps, which is a company that now has over $100 million in revenue. 
uh, and he has founded, invested in, and served on the board of multiple companies. Um, so, Patrick, I'd love to start off maybe with um, if you could describe to someone on active duty, you know, how would you describe High Ridge Capital and what it is that you do there? Uh, you bet. So, um, you know, High Ridge is is really a uh, an investment, it's like an over an investment and advisory firm. And, you know, really the story of High Ridge only makes sense in, in, in the kind of fuller context of my background. So, you know, after being in investment banking and, uh, and leaving and going out to Silicon Valley and uh, first joining somebody's company and spending a couple of years learning, learning my, my, the ropes of Silicon Valley and then, and then co-founding a company and, and uh, being part of the leadership for five years and, and then eventually uh, exiting that company that was at LiveOps, which was sold back in 2008. Um, I went on and, and started a couple other companies, a company called uh, Kinex, which was an ad tech company, uh, ran that for a couple of years, sold it. And then um, what I realized was I, I really enjoyed the operating side, but also the investing. And once I had a couple exits, um, I had a, ball, a, a, a body of knowledge of you know, how to run things, how to hire people, how to evaluate ideas, and also had some capital to deploy. So I started angel investing. And so what High Ridge really is is, a, is, a, is an organization that kind of brings together operating experience and capital, and we do three things. Um, we'll passive invest in companies. So this is somebody else's idea, early stage, really at the angel level, evaluating their business plan, um, thinking through, is this a great team? Do they have the passion? Do they have that killer instinct that they're going to make uh, a great company or, or go down with the ship uh, trying? And then just deploy passive capital and, and help them and advise them. Uh, also, uh, we'll advise companies, do board seats, uh, work on transitions, help companies kind of through the cycle. And then the thing that I love to do the most, which is actually incubate ideas, and then launched them as uh, kind of part of the founding team, which I've now done four times, where I had an idea or somebody else had the idea, and we worked collaboratively, typically for over 12 months. Uh, we'll just kick things around, make lots of investments in different uh, different uh, directions, and then ultimately we will form a company. Um, High Ridge will be the initial capital. Um, I'll serve as a, a very active executive chairman, and then we'll kind of run down and, and start raising outside money once we get the product up and running. So High Ridge kind of brings those three elements together. That sounds like a dream job. That sounds incredible. And I, I can see how it leverages your experience from, from operating and the uh, evaluating and, and building side of your background. Um, just for context for listeners, um, you know, how many, how would you, what, what numbers or what sort of scale would you apply to what you're doing in terms of maybe investments that you've done or companies you've worked with, how would you give them like a sense of like um, where you're at as, as a company? So we currently High Ridge has 22 active investments. And, you know, one interesting thing about that is um, I didn't mention this earlier, but uh, the premise of High Ridge is that there's talent everywhere and not every investment is actually in Silicon Valley, which uh, would be the typical for an early stage uh, investment company. It really uh, worked hard to find opportunities outside of Silicon Valley. So of those 22, 11 are in San Francisco Bay Area and 11 are outside of, of the Bay Area from Portland, Maine to Baltimore to Miami, Atlanta, Chicago, recently in Youngstown, Ohio is one of the newer investments. Um, so we have 22 active investments. There are four companies that are current operating businesses that we had a, a hand in incubating, and we've had six exits. And which is, you know, from an investment perspective, those are the important things. So we've exited successfully six times. That's awesome. And you know, one thing that came I, that I was curious about when you were talking about that is having been part of so many different startups, and then now having you know, started your own ideas and helped others start theirs. I know a lot of members that listen to this podcast, they aspire to start their own company. What advice do you have about how to vet an idea or how to see if, if a company has legs and, and kind of kick the tires before plunging deep on it or, or really investing one's time and money in it? 
you know, it's really the perennial question. <laughs> you know, if anybody says they have the actual answer, then run, right? Because this is uh, this is a lot of trial and error. There's a, there's a lot more failure than success. That's really the, the truth of it. Whether you're the founder or the investor, um, you know, the one of the differences when you're when you're the founder, you're taking one shot. When you're the investor, obviously, you have a portfolio. So, you know, really the, the direct answer is if, if you're thinking about starting a company or and if you're thinking about joining a company, you should have kind of this or a startup, you should have kind of a similar mindset to it because, you know, this is going to be all encompassing. This is what you're going to do. And you should think about you're going to be doing this for five to seven years. You know, the average ex- exit from, an, from a startup is seven years. That's on average. So some of them are longer, some of them are shorter. But you really need to look at it as a long-term relationship. And then so if you're joining a company or starting it, you have to really look at it honestly and say, is this something that I feel passionate about, the problem we're solving, the solution that we're bringing to market, and then just as importantly, the team that I'm going to be working with, that I'll be able to maintain that tempo for, for, for seven years. And so like, that's kind of table stakes on you know, whether you should start something or join something. And then kind of above that, you know, for me personally, I can really come from a, a business development and sales background. I'm, I'm not a technologist. You know, I've worked on lots of products and hired and worked with great engineering. And we can talk about how to assess that at some point. But, you know, the thing that, that I'm really, you know, kind of have my, my expertise in is evaluating a market, seeing the vulnerability, understanding the problem. And then, you know, saying, you know, do we have a unique solution that's defensible, that's scalable, that's going to match this market? And, you know, we get strong, what I call conviction on matching those two things. And, and that's really, that's really we need to start because it's going to be an up and down journey. And if you can't get strong conviction uh, at the very beginning, at least understand the questions that you need to answer. Like, oh, here's three things that we need to prove that will prove our solution and, and be clear about that and then kind of go along the journey. But there's a lot of work to do up front that will improve your success rate. That's great. And another thing that occurred to me as you were saying that was was just wondering, I, I just think of like the hypothetical veteran who might be sitting across the table from you telling you about their idea. And I'm wondering what are the the – if someone was coming straight out of active duty and aspiring to start a company, first of all, like, would you wave them off on that? Like, would you say, Hey, you need to get more experience first. And I'm wondering like, what, what are some of the skill sets that they're probably lacking that they need to actively build up as they think of starting their own company? So, I mean, I, I so there's a, there's a couple of different types of starting your own company, kind of entrepreneurism here. So, you know, I would really put it in context. So if somebody coming out of the military is coming in and they are proposing a you know, technology-based startup, then we'd have a whole set of series of questions of, of you know, what do they understand? Is it something they worked on while they were in the military? Did they have some other background? Did they, is there some experience that will lead them to um, understanding the problem that they want to tackle? And if it's a technology-based uh, uh, idea, then, you know, what is it about their background that either are they the developer or are they a product? Do they get product experience in the military? Um, understanding that not everybody's a, you know, a war fighter, right? So there's lots of backgrounds in the military that could give people that very specific experience. And then what I would do is understanding what that person's, you know, what their, what their deep skill would, then I would really start asking questions to see if they have good awareness of the things that they might need. So, if they are coming out of something and they understand the problem really well and they're kind of product oriented, do they understand that they need to get a really strong technical person with them? Like, do they really understand that that's where their weakness is and, and have they identified or thought through what that technical person would look like, what skills they would need? If they're a little bit more technical, like say they, there's other parts of the service where they may be developers or they, they've coded things, or maybe they have a partner, you know, they found somebody and they're developing something, but they're really, this is kind of a sales oriented business. Do they understand that this is going to be a marketing and sales type thing? And then they identify that and understand what that would look like. So, you know, somebody coming out of the military directly, um, I'd really have a lot of questions about what's their awareness level of the other pieces that they're going to need at the table, which would be different than if they were in the military, they left and they went and worked at a company. And then they kind of, I would expect that they would have seen, you know, engineering, product development, go to market, 
capital raising and those things. So when they come with the idea, I have a more, more confidence and they kind of seen the full scope of it. So that might be the difference between the two. That's great. And, and I wanted to back up to when you first got out of the military, you, you went to business school, you got your MBA, and then you entered into the world of finance. And I, I know a lot of listeners, um, that's a popular industry that a lot of people ask about is about finance and, and um, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, the, the places that you've worked. I'm curious for someone that wants to go down that initial path that you went down in finance, how essential is an MBA for a, a typical veteran getting out of the military? Well, for me, that was a very natural way to kind of catch up to my peer group. So, you know, at ROTC at University of Southern California, um, I actually majored in accounting which <laughs> turns out to have been a really smart thing to do, but at the time it was kind of nerdy. <laughs> but, uh, but um, so, you know, I did, I had a four year active duty obligation um, and uh, went and did that service. And I didn't think about anything besides what I was doing at the time, knowing that after the four years, I would, I always kind of had the plan that I would go to business school at some point after, ser- after my service and kind of, kind of catch back up with my, Peer group who had you know went straight into the commercial side and had worked as analysts or or uh, financial advisors or whatever, so that was kind of my plan the whole time was to to get the MBA. Um, you know the value of it, um, it was quite essential to get into a J.P. Morgan or a Goldman Sachs or or any of the kind of you know traditional Wall Street tracks. Um, at the time that I, I did it, it was it was really important. It was kind of a way to validate. Um, that you had the technical kind of finance skills. And what I will say to, to our veteran community is, is you know, they're, they're, you, you really do get the benefit of the doubt on hard work, initiative, you know, just the quality of your, your, uh, of your effort. And those were always kind of givens. The questions for me were always, do you technically understand the business we're in? Are you going to be able to handle the, the, the technical piece of the workload? Do you know the products? Do you know those kind of things? And I think the MBA kind of gave me the ability to get that summer internship, which then gave me the firsthand experience that then I was able to say, hey, you know I'm a hard worker. I've now spent time, you know, seeing the game up, up close and personal. And then, frankly, that accounting background for me <laughs> that actually worked out pretty well. Was, uh, that was the thing that a lot of people struggle with is actually the kind of our deeper level of, of the financial analysis and, and having a whole degree in it kind of took some of the question marks off. So kind of that whole combination uh, made it a pretty straightforward transition for me. And you were there, you were between JP Morgan and Morgan Stanley about two years. I'm just curious what that experience was like and, and specifically what you learned there that's helped you in your, your current role. You know, it's a short amount of time, but they are dog years. You know, there's uh, there's definitely um, a lot of hours and a lot of different things going on there. I, I found it to be kind of the best, some of the best training in business training that uh, that you can get. I mean, I guess there's there's consulting and which is also excellent training. And and I'm you know being a, a early associate at a law firm, you would you would grind it out uh, at uh, investment banking. And I was on the Merchant and acquisition side of, of the house, so it was very analytical. Lots of de- lots of deals happening, buying and selling companies quite regularly. Um, you know, those two years were just really foundational in my understanding of, of business valuation, um, markets, uh, value creation, storytelling, the whole process. And so, it was quite fundamental. I will say that that um, the reason I left is I, I really just didn't like the business. And I think that this is an important thing for, um, our, you know, the, the veteran community and, and people in general are thinking about going into the finance jobs. Um, uh, I just didn't really find it that creative. And so after a couple of years of doing it where you're, you know, you acquire a company, you sell a company, you raise capital for a company, it is incredibly exciting. There's nothing I love. The first couple of years just thinking, wow, I can't believe this public board is going to take work that I did and, uh, and make a decision and then we're going to execute this transaction. It is very exciting. But for me at the time, it, was, it just didn't feel that creative. And then the opportunity to 
uh, go out to Silicon Valley and, and join a company that had raised capital and head off in that direction just felt more more productive, like it was going to produce something that it was going to be creative. And, and, um, and so that is just where my heart told me, but that background has served me very well in every role that I've had since. I, I know a lot of listeners sometimes ask about lifestyle and I'm just curious, what was your basic lifestyle, like just hours per week or like what, what time did you get up and get home while you were in finance? And how does that compare to maybe the average of your experience in Silicon Valley and in startups. I'm just curious to see what that lifestyle difference is. Hmm. Well, 100 hour weeks are harder to do than people think. I mean, the thing about veterans is, you know, we kind of, we live in our workplace. So it's a, it's a different sense of what a 100 hour week would be like, but to be actually in the office for a hundred hours, that's a lot of time. Like you got to do at least one all nighter, and that, that, is, that was the pace that um, I was on when I was uh, on Wall Street, um, particularly as a young associate. Um, but when you weren't in the office, you weren't doing anything. And that's the big difference between if you're out doing a startup, you know, the number of hours in the office is one thing, but it is all encompassing. When you're at a startup, either as a founder or early employee or early operator, you, know, you don't punch out at five or six or eight or 10 it's kind of always with you. So, you know, maybe it's not as many hours in the office when you're doing a startup, but the office is with you in your pocket, um, in the back of your mind, in the middle of the night when you wake up panicked about, you know, are you going to hit some milestone or, or whatever the, the task is. So they're both grinding in their own way. But, you know, that's why I think it's really important for whoever's deciding what path they're going to go is as much as you can up front evaluate is this something that I'm passionate about? Is this something that I love to do? Because both of these career paths are very all-encompassing, and it's really hard to fake that you enjoy it. And if you're not enjoying it, then I don't think you'll be good at it. Wow, I love that distinction. I, I mean, it, it is interesting. I hadn't thought of that before, the all-consuming nature of the startup and, and how both of those career paths are exceptionally demanding, but in, in different ways. I think that was a, a well-put um, comparison. So how, how did you make that transition then to, it was originally Ingenio and uh, Keen, and then I'm especially curious about Live Ops, how you found your way to the, the founding team of what's, in my view, such an iconic brand. I think everyone in the Valley knows Live Ops. Um, how did that all come about? So, you know, one of the most important things you can invest in at any time in your career is your network. And, um, and uh, so many opportunities come up, whether it's from where you went to school or who you worked with or who you socialize with, um, because you know, the, the, the most interesting opportunities uh, at the earliest stage come through those things. So I'll definitely put that on the table. Um, and specifically how I got out to, to Silicon Valley, I was at my desk and uh, you know, grinding away, um, a little bit you know, loose in the saddle, as we say. And I, I got a call from a friend who uh, I had gone to undergrad with, and he's like, hey, we just raised uh, $60 million for this idea, um, and it's being incubated at Benchmark Capital in Silicon Valley on Sand Hill Road. And I was like, great, why are you calling me? He's like, oh, we're going to be acquiring a bunch of companies. It's a good time to come out and you know join the new economy. And I thought, maybe this is the time. So I went out, took a look at it. It was a crazy time, and uh, I was kind of ready to come back to California, frankly. I hadn't grown up in California, living in New York, and it just seemed like the, you know, the opportunity knocked, and I was willing and ready, and so I jumped. And you know, I kind of looked at it. You know, it was benchmark capital. That's you know, blue chip. It was a lot of money they raised. Um, the idea, I honestly couldn't evaluate the idea very well at the time, um, but the role was something that I could be good at. They said, you know, I was like, what do you need? And the person with investment banking background says, we're going to acquire a bunch of companies and acquire and, and raise money. And I thought, well, I can do those things. And so I knew I had a, you know, a strategic role in the company. And so, so I jumped in knowing that I was going to learn a lot. And frankly, that I kind of was a, in a, a journeyman role of did a lot of different things over the course of two years, but, you know, knowing that at some point I would you know, need to leave and, um, and do my own thing. And so, that was, uh, you know, going in eyes open, and it was a great, 
two years. And then again, through the network, I uh, was kind of ready to kind of learn product and learn about engineering and learn uh, capital raising and learn, you know, private company acquisitions. It's, again, you'll see a theme here, just constantly building your skill set. You have to constantly be building your skill set, yeah, which is really vital. <clears throat> and then through the network, I, I, got, I met some engineers that were, had been at Netscape and tell me and, and they were working on this technology and they weren't sure what to do with the technology, what the disruption was be, would be. And um, they demoed it for me and I saw what they were doing. And, and actually this is more my signal experience. This is a great story for, 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 for our community here. So I was a, a signal core officer um, trained in telecom, right? And, you know, managed switches and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and so really understood traditional telecom infrastructure and uh, these engineers who became my co-founders, they had um, developed a, this soft switch, basically using your computer, you could control a big piece of hardware somewhere else and make the phone ring. And what I knew was that was massively disruptive. And what we didn't know together was where that disruption was gonna lead us. And so me understanding the, you know, the 10X, uh, the 10X um, innovation disruption that, that this technology was gonna bring, I had the confidence to join and said, we're going to figure out something big to do with this technology. And that actually led to eventually, you know, live ops. We use that technology to power our home agents, drive down the cost, do all the routing and build this big platform. But it was really from that kernel of lowering the cost of, of making the phone ring. That's wild. I'm just thinking back in 116 interviews, I can only think of one other person who directly took what they did in the military and were able to apply that to to what they did <laughs> afterwards, actually. And so, I, I mean, obviously a lot occurred between your leaving the military. You had the MBA, you had the finance experience, you had another startup experience. But it's crazy to think that you were still able to reach back to that signal experience and be able to use that to evaluate an idea in, in a way that not many people on the face of the planet would be able to do. That's That's really cool. You're right. That is unique. That was like six <laughs> years later too. Yeah. You know, we worked with this very clear switching technology that we were, this technology was getting rid of that switch. And I knew how expensive that switch was and all the cap capabilities of that. I'm like, okay, if this can do that at one tenth the cost, all right. <laughs> That's awesome. And, um, you know, I want to talk more about the process of starting High Ridge Capital, but what would you want listeners to know about your career path from live ops up until starting High Ridge Capital? Because you, you had some pretty interesting things that occur along the way. Boy, you know, um, you know, it, it is such a journey. So, you know, I, I think I would just say be just be open. Right. Because uh, I could never have predicted any of these steps too far in advance. Um, you know, when I, you know, when I was growing up in this small town, I knew I'd leave the small town. And eventually I, I you know, proactively knew that I was going to do the ROTC program. But I didn't know much after that. I certainly didn't know that I was going to be on Wall Street. And I certainly didn't know that I would uh, be working, you know, at a company that was literally on, on Sand Hill Road. <laughs> Um, I didn't know that I was going to become a founder. I didn't know that I would go on to found four companies and eventually uh, just build this passion for helping other people achieve their dreams. And so I, I think that, uh, you know, I just, you just don't know. But what I can, what I get back to was, was, was really the thing that has really directed me through this whole thing is, is like, there's this cliche that says when you do what you love, you never work. If you do, if you, if you, if you, if you love, if you do, is that, is that saying? <laughs> yeah. You, like that, that sense of like, if you're really passionate about what you're doing, yeah. it, doesn't, it doesn't seem yeah. like work. It seems like just an extension it's of yourself. It's no longer work. Yeah. Yep. Yes. It's no longer work. And if you just follow that and that sounds so cliche, but in each one of these senses, it's like, okay, I was loving this piece and then I wasn't loving as much. So I'm ready for the next thing and I'm loving this. Yeah. And then I didn't hold on to these things. And, as I'd been then after being the founder a couple times and being, you know, the CEO of, of, of one of these companies, um, I realized, okay, I can do more and, and change my role and now be an investor, an early stage advisor, uh, an executive chairman, a co-founder. And, uh, and I think 
and, and, and they really do build on each thing as you kind of get these skill sets and, and these skill sets uh, I'm able to kind of transmit these things to, to other founders and other teams, which I, which I actually love to do, which may be why I've been able to do it relatively successfully. Hmm. You know, uh, self-knowledge is something that comes up a lot with people I interview and, and what I'm hearing and, and tell, tell me if I'm wrong on this, but what I love about what you're saying is this sense of openness allows you to really listen to yourself on what you enjoyed and you didn't enjoy. And that's, that's what brought you initially from finance is you just realize like, Hey, this is like great, but this is not what I want to do. And so you kind of followed that you kept your network alive and it kind of led you from one thing to another. But what I love about what it seems like you've built with high Ridge global is you've got what I'm betting are the pieces you've enjoyed in your career leading up to that. You've got, the, the companies where you're able to get a little bit hands dirty and roll up your sleeves and actually help ideate and form the idea. You've got the ones where you're just advising. You've got the ones where you're just investing. And it, it seems like you've constructed this organization where you're able to stretch these different three or four facets that you real, of work that you really enjoy. And I imagine the diversity is probably part of it too, is that you're not just doing one of them. You're able to kind of scratch several different itches simultaneously. Great summary. Absolutely, <laughs> I, I, I'm I'm very proud of, uh, of 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 building it the way you described. It's very accurate. Mm. And I will say, for people who are starting out in their careers, that path isn't for everybody. Mm. And and this is that, back to that self knowledge. Some people really like to do one thing really excellent and continue to do that thing over and over again and just make it better and better and just get just be like deep in knowledge. And today's market, in many ways values depth over breadth, right? So um, I would say that, you know, my path is somewhat unique in that I've been finding the things that I love. There are some very consistent um, uh, patterns. Early on, I learned, you were talking about live ops, I learned about distributed workforces. Mm. Like This is a really critical thing that I tie that through all my businesses. So I'm a deep expert in distributed work, like how do people work from home, work remote, work in different locations? How do how does technology um, uh, engage us to increase productivity? Whether we're sitting next to each other, sitting apart from each other, sitting in different parts of the world, what where's the trend of that technology? Um, how do people engage with work when they're remote? Like all these themes are remote and distributed, and the technology stack that's been built around it. I have a deep expertise in that. And so when I'm doing all these different things, there is this deep insight mm -hmm. that, I, you know, as I keep turning this, this box around in different ways and looking at the world through it and it, it grows, but it's not like um, being a jack of all trades. And I, I think that I don't want that to get lost is that having a deep insight on something and then finding different ways to apply it to the market is is the kind of is a foundational piece of what I I built uh, this career on. Yeah, the uh, for listeners, I, I I think for listeners who are interested in this, I, I had Cal Newport, who's an author on the show, and he wrote a book called Deep Work, and I I have a summary of that. It's on if you search the site on Beyond the Uniform, you'll find it. But it's an exceptional book to read, and I, I echo what you're saying, Patrick. Where it seems like more and more now you will be rewarded in the workplace for people who have deep experience rather than generalists, which is, you know, for, for most people on the, the, especially on the officer side, when you come out of the military, you were basically a generalist. You were, you know, you, you had to be that jack of all trades. And it's, I, I, I what I'm hearing is the, um, is the advantage for being able to gain that deep expertise. And you can apply that expertise in a variety of ways, but having that knowledge, having that skill set or that view on the world is really valuable. And that, and that, it sounds like from your experience, that came from you know six years of an intense working environment at one of the fastest growing companies in Silicon Valley. So you know, hard, hard earned experience, but still deep experience that you've been able to leverage elsewhere. If I can tie that back to a question you asked me earlier about for, you know, um, a, a veteran a serviceman coming out of the military and he or she are thinking what's their first stop, whether, you know, business school is the whole thing. If you don't want to be a banker or consultant, 
don't go to business school. Business mm-hmm. school is for banking and consulting. That, mm-hmm. That's general in my view. If you want to be an entrepreneur, you don't need to go to business school. Um, I, I would second and, that. As, um, as a business school turned <laughs> startup guy, I mean, there's a lot that I appreciate and, and leverage from that experience, but it's not by no means essential and, and probably not as relevant as, as other paths to that. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, but I thought that was a great point. Uh, and so the, the, the thing that I, you reminded me of something, I had recently advised um, a young entrepreneur who came right out of school, graduated from college and did a startup. And I backed his startup and his startup failed relatively fast like within a year and a half. And he was trying to figure out what he should do next. And he had learned something and it was in video chat. And, um, and so we were talking about it and we we're spending a lot of time and, and, and it didn't matter that he had failed. It's normal. And, and as he was evaluating his next thing, it became very clear. I said to him, and I won't say his name. I said, look, you have the opportunity right now to figure out what industry that you want to play in for the next 10 years. Right. You're young, you have an experience, you are very smart, and pick, there's like five or six trends that are interesting to you. Pick one of them and either join or start a company in that vertical and go deep and get that experience. And he's doing that now. He picked one of them, and, and I'm confident that, that he's going to, you know, he's sharp enough to like, he's working for somebody else right now, and getting that deep experience around in this vertical, it's a new nascent thing that's kind of growing, then he will be an early expert in that space. And then that advantage will have an exponential return to him. And so I guess the flip side of that would be to go to a company that's in a mature market that's late in its cycle. That's fine too. You're going to have a stable operating experience. They'll likely, your experience will likely not be that valuable to a new startup. Um, it will probably be more valuable to a big company and it'll be very stable. And that's a terrific path to go. Um, and there'll be a lot of people who know what you know, and, and there'll be lots of jobs because you can kind of see it. But the other side of it is, like I said, pick a trend and join or start a company in this trend that you find fascinating, whether it's AI or machine learning or robotics or whatever, um, you know, you know, virtual reality games, augmented reality games. Um, cryptocurrency, right? I just gave you like eight of them. <laughs> like, any one of those is like something that still today you can be an early expert in it. And as the market forms around it, you will then have been there from this early stage and uh, will have a big advantage of people come, who, who come later. Uh, there's so much I appreciate about what you just said, but um, one of the things that strikes me is You've, you've kind of highlighted the flip side of what I've heard on a lot of these interviews, and that's that a lot of the people I interview are veterans who get out of the military, and they um, a lot of veterans have this assumption that they're going to go work for a company and stay there for a long time, and then are surprised or disappointed or self-critical when they, after a year, they realize they don't like something and they move on. And that, that thought of moving quickly is different than they're used to. And um, so the, it seems like that's been a learning point of a lot of people I've had on the shows. Of it's, it's okay to like try something and not like it and move on. What I love about what you're saying, though, is um, you know, you've had this trend in a couple of things you've said now where you know, if you start a company, evaluate it on a seven-year term or a 10-year term or, or approaching things as like building up expertise over a decade. And I think that's something that veterans are really, on the average, really well suited for. They're, they have a strong sense of commitment, a strong sense of discipline, a strong stick to itness that that really favors them and gives them a natural advantage over a lot of other people who might not be as diligent to really commit to something and to, to really um, staying with it. And so that's not to say that you shouldn't switch around, but I think that what you're highlighting is that if you can pick that trend well, and um, that a lot of those attributes that serve people in the military could serve them on the other side too, of being able to grow with an industry and, and kind of be one at the forefront of, a, of an emerging trend. And, and, and you know, the, the, the guardrails that I would put around what you said there was to compare, what I was saying is that it's not stay with the same company necessarily for the mm-hmm. seven years. I mean, that yeah. would be the, that's the length of a, of a typical Yep. But within that industry, yes. acknowledge that you might have to do two or three different companies. Yeah. That's the beauty of it. Mm. Right? If you say, I love virtual reality, well, go work for a virtual reality game. Yeah. Right? Go work for one. And if that one fails and you've built something and you want to stay in the VR space over the course of a career, 
you're kind of moving within a tighter band, even if you're moving around, you're developing deeper expertise. Yep. And that might that. be different than where we go and spend 20 years, 30 years at GE, and maybe we do a bunch of things within GE, and now you're an expert at GE. Mm. Versus here, you're a virtual reality person, and you work at five companies over the course of 20 years, and you're a deep expert in virtual reality. <laughs> I love versus that. Any one company. Yeah, I think that's such a great distinction. To yeah, it's like the commitment to the the field or the industry or the space, rather than the the single company or even the, the one's own company. Um, one one thing I was curious about, you know, you've had such an interesting career path. I, I always like to ask about resources, and that's just any book or website or program, anything that's been really helpful to you, and that could be in finance and startups and investing. Um, what resources have been really helpful to you that you think might benefit a veteran who's listening to the show, the, the podcast? Well, um, you know, I guess I would, uh, maybe there's a couple different ways I'll you know, put a few things on the table, right? So there are kind of the, the longer form things that you can do, and, and I'll, I'll put two categories here. One are biographies. Like for me, I love reading biographies. I just, I just, I just learn so much. They're usually fast reads, you know, like read Elon Musk biography. That's a, that's a great read. Right? I that's love that one. Care about. I, just a, I just did so that good, by right? audio book. I thought it was great. Yeah, it's terrific. Um, or like for me, like one of my favorite, it's kind of uh, out of the, out of the, out of, out of here a little bit is the first American, which is the biography of, of Benjamin Franklin, uh, HW brand. Like to me, he's an ultimate entrepreneur and a great American. And like, there's a form in his life and probably the way the historian write, writes uh, that biography, because it's not an autobiography, it just puts so much shape to a well-lived life. Mm. Um, and so there's the biographies. And then there's kind of the technical long reads, you know, like everybody who's going to do a startup or work for a startup should probably read The Hard Thing About Hard Things, Ben Horowitz's book. And you know, I just think it's, it's a really good book and it kind of, it, it kind of, recounts a lot of the challenges and the cycles of things. So finding things like that. Um, so those are kind of on the long form biographies and some, some technical things in your industry. Um, then, then there's just staying current, uh, you know, like uh, picking a podcast or a blogger or something like that, that, that you really like to follow. Um, you know, that those are really good. Um, and and I, I like to have a variety. Like, uh, like for me, I like Stitcher. I like the, uh, like this. These are really fun. So like Sam Harris or Chris Tippett, Reason, um, here's the thing. There's a bunch of uh, really great uh, podcasts uh, that are, are available um, that are just worthy listens. And there's, there's a ton. I didn't, wasn't comprehensive in that. Uh, and then of course there's industry stuff, Wire, TechCrunch, Venture Beat. I mean, you just have to stay like the day-to-day -day heartbeat of that thing. Um, but then also, like I, I like uh, I like um, you know science fiction within the world that we're in. You know, like Crux or Cryptonomicon. These are like really great books that kind of are more humanities oriented, kind of tell us these bigger forms that get our brains thinking bigger and certainly outside of our verticals. You know, like human nature, like the moral animal, or you know, guns, germs, and steel, or everybody read Sapiens last year. Like these are really key books that uh, I think keep our brains fresh. And, you know, one nice thing about, like, say, a book like Sapiens is, like, basically everybody, at least in the tech industry, is reading that book at the same time. And so you can kind of be part of that conversation. Um, so those are some different things. I love the way you broke that down. And I, I think you might be the first guest I've had on the show. And, and this definitely, I'm latching onto it because it matches my own thinking but i think that science fiction is such a great exploration for people who are on tech and just time the exploring what technology could become but also the moral side of of what that says about us as humans mm -hmm. so i love i love those recommendations and for listeners in the show notes i'll have links to all of those uh different books and uh articles and and um podcasts that he mentioned i i know that we're running um a little short on time i I would love to, um, I always like to make room at the end. I'd love to make a little bit more room here is that, um, you know, Patrick, you've got such an incredible background and 
I, I always like to leave space at the end. You know, there's so much that I asked about, but I'm sure there's so much that I didn't ask about that you have really good advice for veterans. And so I'd love to just kind of make space for what have we not talked about that you think, you know, when you're talking to and, and advising different people that's helpful for them that, that you think might be helpful for a veteran or someone on active duty who's listening? Let's see here. So, you know, I, I try to sit across the table or on the phone with with veterans as much as I much as I can. I mean, it's it's a uh, it's a group that I care a lot about, and uh, it's also a group that I have a lot of confidence in. So, you know, the first place I would start is that I think a lot of us when we're leaving the military, we have a lot of doubts. Like, was my experience valuable? Did I learn enough? You know, everybody's been doing all these cool things and and being in business, and uh, I'm going to be so far behind. So I think it's always good to have humility, right? Expect that people, but also don't lose that confidence that your experiences are incredibly valuable. The, the thing we need to do is find the translation for those, whether you're, you know, a platoon sergeant or a platoon leader, whether you were, you know, a crypto guy or a translator, right? There's, there are, there's something within your experience that, that you can quantify and that will give you very measurable skills that then you map them to the world that you're about to go into. So that's one. Two is like the thing I really love about where we are right now in our society is that I think veterans are really respected and they're given the first, they're really given the benefit of the doubt, which is a great, I think we've earned it. And I think that we also, um, don't be afraid to take it, not take advantage of it in a bad way, but like, like harness that opportunity, right? When somebody says, Hey, thank you for your service. You should call me when you get out, call them, <laughs> they call them. <laughs> don't, don't not call people want to help people want to, you know, give you advice. Oh, so here's the third one is ask for advice and you're going to get a lot more. Right. So like, I'm, I don't know if that's necessarily a veteran thing, but you get doors open to you. And when you ask for advice, People are going to be open and they're going to want to help you. And if you actively listen, they're going to direct you in ways about yourself that, that may surprise you. And so ask for advice and you get a lot more. And those are, those are really important wisdom. So, so you have skills that are very marketable and finding a way to translate them. People want to help you and they're going to give you the benefit of the doubt. So, so open those doors and, um, and don't just be afraid to ask for advice, but actively ask for advice. People love to talk about themselves. Look, we're talking now for 45 minutes. This <laughs> opportunity to prove my point. Mm -hmm. Is there, you know, one thing just to add, I love all three of those. I'm, I'm curious because um, I've had a lot of people ask questions on networking, coffee chats. There's this like big unknown there. What advice do you have for them on, you know, because there's this piece about like, also valuing the person's time. So I think asking for advice is so valuable, but you've sat across from so many different people. What are the, what are the times when you know, like, like this person's done their homework or you could, you're able to go deeper, like any, any advice on things to do before they reach out or before they sit across the table from someone like you? That is an incredibly important question and incredibly important for people to pay close attention to it. So there's two things. When, um, when you're sitting down with somebody whose time you value, do your homework. One, what is it that you want advice about? Not like, what should my future be? Like, what is it that you should? And then two, what is it in this person's background that you think may, um, uh, might map to that, that request that you have? And it's not a fixed thing. It's just a starting point, right? It's like, I am interested in wealth management. Like that's a great career path, by the way, for veterans, um, like wealth management, asset management. I think I just want to, I started a company recently um, that is in this pace. And as I think about it, um, the, the, the traits that, that um, veterans have are map really well to the types of people who are going to be successful in financial planning and asset management in the future where it becomes less salesy and more operational. Um, but for example, uh, if you were thinking about um, a job, a, a career in asset management, and you see that I co-founded a company in this space, um, you may think 
I'm interested in assets. So you might say, Patrick, how can I get in asset management? What in my military background would help me? What are the things that I would need to do? And then I would then know how to help you, right? So now you would know, like if you ask me about machine learning or AI or um, there's a bunch of things that you could that you might be interested in that wouldn't map to my experience, and you may actually know the questions you want to ask. But the fact that I don't have a connection to it would be a very boring and short conversation. Versus, and, and, and frankly, you should ask for advice more based on the person who you're talking to rather than your own needs in many ways. Yep. Um, because they're there to tell you, they're there to transmit what they already know, not. To get homework right don't expect people to do homework for you like that's the beauty of giving advice it's something that i already have an inventory of it's in my closet and you come and you ask for it and i say oh here i have some running shoes and and a workout gear oh i already have this i don't have to go buy it for you you know what i mean like so i think getting that match but uh we kind of went i went a little long-winded on it but that is such an important thing when you sit down be crisp and be open to the conversation but be crisp about something that you would like advice on that matches the experience of the person you're talking to. Yeah, I think that's such critical advice, and it's just and and, and I think for people listening, don't don't take um, don't take anything that we're talking about as a reason not to reach out. It's like literally, you could be doing this in ten or fifteen minutes. It doesn't need to be some massive week long project, but looking at their background, seeing what's easy for them to talk about, and I, I think there's some some component of kind of like not ass kissing, but some component of like showing that you did the homework. Like, and I, I, I just say this cause you know, I, I've met with people where it was so clear they knew nothing about anything I had done. And it's just like, it, it makes my desire to help them so much less. Whereas if someone, it just right. has that, that, just the little breadcrumbs of like, Hey, I saw that you went to this business school. I saw that you went here. I saw that you were on the USS Alaska. It's just little, little toeholds. It's like, okay, this person's at least done some level of, of research. And, um, and I love that thought too, that Patrick, that you said, it's like, not about what I'm wanting to get out of this. It's like, what is the person I'm speaking to? What's their unique perspective that I can really tap into? Um, so Patrick, thank you so much for your time on, on, and advice on all of this. I really appreciate your, your taking the time for the interview. I really enjoyed it. And thanks for the work that you're doing. It's really important. Surface, surface, surface. All right, folks, I hope you enjoyed my interview with Patrick McKenna. I hope you check out those resources. If you do uh, want to check out one of those books, check out audible.com. Uh, if you go to beyondtheuniform.io slash books, you'll find a free offer. You'll get a free uh, Amazon Audible book of your choice. All of these books that he recommends would be great on audiobook. The Elon Musk one and The Hard Thing About the Hard Things are two books he recommended that I did on audiobook. Uh, it's a great way to plow through these things without taking up extra time from your already busy day. Uh, second, if you haven't already, would greatly appreciate an iTunes review. Helps us get the word out about this. Um, lastly, if you do know of a veteran or someone on active duty who would benefit from these interviews, uh, would love to get this in front of more people. And so if you have advice for that, drop me a line. Or if you want us to pass this along to people or groups, would always greatly appreciate that. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll be back next week with more interviews with veterans about their civilian career.